This clip contains the core mathematical tools in my reasoning on the uncertainty series. The session will be a little theoretical, uh, but that can't be avoided. If these concepts seem a little abstract, hopefully the later videos will make the concepts more concrete. If you do not understand the presentation here, do not despair. The first videos afterward will only use a few of the mathematical rules described here, and I'll post this on a web page there uh, at the top of the video description. Uh, first a little incentive though. As I said in the first video in this series, probability can be said to measure plausibility judgments in a mathemat mathematical manner. While this was more or less taken for granted for quite some time, a solid foundation for doing so was discovered by Richard T. Cox about 50 years ago. Uh, though I prefer the way E.T. Jaynes uh, presented it. A uh, set of properties that we would like our um, possibility measure to comply to were uh, listed uh, and uh, these were we want a measure that's a real number. Uh, B, it needs to comply with at least one simple common sense rule for dealing with the plausibility. And if you're wondering what that entails, see the webpage or better Jane's book. And see some consistency needs to be enforced. Amazingly, this uh, yield a set of rules that uh, correspond to the already established concept of probability. So here are the rules. First, the ground rule. We can take the probability of any logical proposition, i.e. the probability is closed under not and an or. 1. The probability of a proposition A is a real number in the interval 0 to 1, where 1 codes for A being certainly true, 0 codes for A being certainly false, and anything in between codes for different levels of uncertainty. So, for instance, the probability of getting an even number on a die, if you already know that you've gotten 4, is 1, while the probability of getting an odd number is then 0. Uh, the probability for getting a 1 on the die is, before you know anything uh, specific, greater than 0 and smaller than 1. And I'll define this as the probabilistic or uncertain realm. Number two, uh, the probability of uh, A plus the probability of not A is equal to 1. This means that the probability should sum to 1. We know that either A or not A is true, but this states uh, in addition that this takes the form of a sum. The probability of getting 1 on a throw of the die is uh, 1 6. So that means that the probability of getting something else is 5 over 6. Rule number three, the probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A times the uh, probability of B given A, and is also equal to the probability of B given uh, times the probability of A given B. Uh, and I will not illustrate that before later. And that's it. Uh, note the last rule which defines how so-called conditional probability works. Uh, in such theoretical terms, if A is conditional on B, the probability can be said to zoom in on B and look only on the part of A that is contained in B. In the logical case, if we condition, we uh, consider only proposition where the conditioned uh, statement is true. Uh, these three rules are not how probability usually is defined, though. Usually you have a statement like probability of B1 or B2 or and so forth BK is equal to the probability of B1 plus the probability of B2 plus the probability and so forth plus the probability of BK where B1 to BK are mutually exclusive. Um, but this can be derived from the three rules. Still it can be well worth remembering this as a separate rule, rule number four. When two statements are not mutually exclusive, we get uh, that the uh, probability of A or B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. And if we jump to a set theoretical approach, this Venn diagram may indicate why. We don't want to count the probability of A and B two times. 
This rule can also be useful to remember, so let's call it rule number 5. Note that I'm calling everything rules here rather than divide it into axioms and theorems. Other reasons for dealing with probability makes uh, mathematicians set up different axioms and um, then deduce uh, the three rules that um, I showed here, the three uh, first rules. Um, I will deal with the prime school in the next video. The third rule can be put on one side as the probability of A given B is the probability of B given A times the probability of A divided by the probability of B. This is called Bayes' formula and at first glance it may not look like much. But think of B as an uh, absurd outcome and A as an unabsurd event or a model and you have the tools for updating the plausibility of the unobserved A from the observation of B. This is exactly the kind of updating rule we were looking for. Since the unobserved A can be called a model, uh, while B can be called observational data, I will usually instead write it as this probability of M given D is the probability of D given M times the probability of M divided by the probability of D where D stands for data and M stands for model. And if there's more than one model available, as it usually is, uh, an index can be put on the model in question. A little terminology. The probability for the unobserved M before, uh, that is unconditioned on the data, uh, uh, is often called the prior, or the a priori probability. The probability of M after the data is often called the posterior or the a posteriori probability. The probability for the data D given the model M is often called the likelihood. In a sense, this probability measures how surprising it is to observe D if M is true. If the probability is low relative to the likelihoods, the data is very surprising and it's and if it's uh, high, the surprise is low. If the data is not surprising, the model can be said to predict well. Uh, so from a base formula, uh, a model that has a high prediction strength for the data so far received will increase in probability. So prediction strength is the key. As long as the probability of uh, D given M is different from the probability of D, that is, the likelihood is different from the marginal data distribution, the probability for model M will change. In such a case, we'll call D evidence regarding M. Note that in base formula, we have the probability of the outcome uh, unconditioned on the model. This may not uh, always be readily available, so we'll need something extra in such cases. We can use rule 4 and make a whole list of mutually exclusive uh, statements, such that at least one of them has to be true. Let's assume that there are k such models, mutually exclusive models. Uh, then it can be shown that we can write probability of A as in rule 6 here. And this can be used in base formula, uh, in this form. Now, since likelihood measures how surprising it is to observe data D for a model M, we can see that if the observed data is less surprising, uh, that is more probable in one model than the other, then the probability for that model will rise. If that's a repeatable situation, the probability will continue to rise, and we can be said to perform induction where we steadily gain confidence in the model. If on the other hand, the probability is zero given the model, the data is as surprising as it gets, and the probability plummets down to zero. We've got complete falsification of the model. However, with probabilistic models, such data can usually not be obtained. If you only want to compare two models, uh, possibly among many, you can get rid of the denominator by dividing the posterior after the data uh, of one model with the posterior probability of the other. 
Dividing one probability by another is called odds and people of a gambling persuasion often tend to use this terminolo terminology. In odds form, a uh, base formula looks like this. 